What's up guys? Welcome back to the infamous project. I'm sitting down, just kind of taking a break from cleaning up the shop, trying to get caught up on some fall cleaning, if you will. So it came to me the other day, I was walking past the stalker vert and I'm like, man, there's a lot of history on this car. Now I have done a video that pretty much explains the whole story about it, but I want to touch on a particular aspect on this car and that's the fact that I've actually sold and bought the car back twice. And a lot of people have opinions about buybacks and whether they're a good thing to do or whether it's like the past is in the past, just keep moving forward and don't worry about it. However, as of recent, I've seen quite a few posts of people trying to find their old cars and I was fortunate. I managed to keep this car close enough within my reach or at least my communication in order to be able to get the car back, not only once, but twice. So I want to talk a little bit about that and what you guys should do for those of you that might be selling your cars. And because you never know, maybe five years down the road, 10 years down the road, maybe uh, your kids want to try and find the car. And this all stems from a video that I watched on uh, VinWiki the other week of a gentleman who, through the VinWiki database, which is pretty much like the VIN number that tells stories. If you guys aren't familiar with it, make sure to check it out. Uh, but pretty cool stuff, right? Because pretty much if you had a VIN number or vehicle, it had a VIN. And if you put in your story with that VIN number, you're essentially adding to the database and the history of and everything else. So with that said, let's kick that intro and we'll come back. We're going to talk about some buybacks. So before we get into things, I do a horrible job, and I always say this, well, I don't really say it because I do such a horrible job, and that is, guys, if you're looking for some merch, because I was just at Foxtoberfest the other weekend, and, you know, I was like Gary does from Castle Customs. I flew in, I drank my beer, I socialized with people, I didn't worry about a tent, I didn't worry about solid merch, but if you guys are interested, it is on the website, theinfamousproject.com. So be sure to check that out and let's get into the story on this car. So I'm not going to go through the whole story. If you guys are interested to know the whole ordeal on the car, by all means, um, I will post the link or the shortcut to the video up in the corner here. So that, that way you guys can see or listen to the story and all the history that comes behind this car. So not only does this car have an interesting like beginning of how I bought it and how I stayed in touch with the owner that I got it from, who is now one of my closest of friends who I consider family. The aftermath or the unraveling of the car just kind of makes for even more of an interesting story. And by that, meaning that not only did I sell the car once, but I sold the car twice and both times ended up with the car back. So the first time that I sold the car was after it was initially built the first time around. So I bought the car. I didn't waste any time. That's when I shaved the locks. I shaved the handles. I shaved the antenna. Pretty much all the body kit minus the Carter's custom stuff. The car actually looked very similar to this, with the exception it had like the old Celine SR351 wing that was, you know, an SN95 wing that they made that you could make them work on a Fox. So yeah, we all made bad decisions back in the day, but it was different from the traditional whale tail. And back then in the early 2000s, people were just kind of throwing anything that you could bolt onto a car onto a car. So 
It had 18 inch ROH drift R's on it. I had the racecraft drop spindles. The car has always been low and the car has always been black from its original paint up until this point. And a real close friend of mine, once it was done, he, he's one of those guys that has all the best intentions of the world when it comes to building a car. And he has had a number of Fox body projects. And this is one of the few individuals that I actually still keep in touch with to this day from high school. And he had gone through iterations of cars. He had a T-top, he had a coupe, he had a four cylinder convertible he was gonna swap. He had another GT convertible with a crazy roll cage, which I ultimately ended up with that car as partial trade for this one. So he wanted a done car. Right. He was tired of the whole project life and going through all of the pains of what it takes to build a full out car. So we made a deal and I ended up with one of his project cars. I ended up with a bunch of cash in my pocket, which allowed me to build another GT convertible. It was a badass car. Um, Viper yellow, uh, same spiel, shaved handles, shaved locks, all that good stuff low to the ground, really enjoyed the car. And, you know, my friend had this one. So a number of years went by and he started tinkering with this car as well. And the car sat and ultimately it ended up being one of my infamous projects like OG builds, right? So when I first did the infamous project in the late 2000s, it was this car when it was still gloss black and we were uh, updating the supercharger, um, I think powder coating intakes, revamping the suspension, doing all these things. In fact, I take back the statement about the race spindles or the racecraft two inch drop spindles. It actually didn't happen until this point. So the car um, went through another build iteration, but essentially for my friend. And that alongside with the 92 BMW AC Schnitzer, uh, the car ended up in satin black, which satin black was kind of the cool thing to do back in the day. And, you know, the car was now personalized to him because it was, you know, the way that he wanted the car, not just, oh, that's the car that, you know, Infamous built and, you know, he bought. It. So personalized to him. And he had the car for a number of years still, right? And it uh, got up to 2013. So probably would have been, uh, if I had to guess, you know, we're pushing, he probably had the car close to, to 10 years. Um, maybe like seven or eight, somewhere around there. But he had the car for a good while. Um, and my friend Lewis, the guy who I had originally bought this car off of, and myself, you know, we were actually both working out in Dubai and Mustangs Across America 2014 was around the corner. And that signified the 50th year of the Mustang, right? 64 and a half, you know, 2014. So my friend wanted to sell this car and he reached out to me and he said, hey man, listen, like I'm going to get rid of the Mustang if you're interested in it. And me and Lewis said, you know, uh, lots of history in the car, right? That's how me and Lewis had met. Why don't we split on the car? We will buy it and we'll drive it across the country from Mustangs across America. So like idiots, we do it. So you can tell that not only just of recent, you know, when I do these crazy trips with uh, Gary or any of my friends across the country, I've been doing this for a long time. And in this case, it was a 16 hour flight just to get to the starting point. So we bought the car back, actually got the car re-cleared because it was still satin black. And I felt like satin black was kind of played out by 2014 and just kind of wanted to refresh. So car got re-cleared and a couple spots blown in and fixed, which this is still the same, I guess, what would we say? This is. Uh, we're 2024 now, so it's 10 year old clear coat, the paint underneath. Some of it's a about then, and some of it might even be older. So 
We also had the motor rebuilt because it uh, had a blown head gasket. It was um, still a drivable car, but it would slowly overheat and tried to kind of get as many things sorted before we had it shipped to California so we could drive it across country. So the car was in my hands again and in my life. And this time it was actually in my life and shared with Lewis, which was awesome because again, he's the one that I had bought the car off of and we had stayed in touch and this car signifies our friendship. So the funny thing is like when we split on the car, we didn't, we thought it'd be cool as a temporary thing. It's like that temporary fix of, yeah, let's get the car because that's how we met and let's drive it across the country and have a good time and, you know, fuck yeah. And we were just going to sell it at the end, and which we did. So we did Mustangs Across America, did the whole thing, had lots of their stories even within that that I'm not sure I touched on in the original story and video on the car. But as soon as we were done, this car went up on eBay and, you know, we flew back to Dubai. A uh, car was at another friend's place in Florida. A lovely lady reached out to me. She wanted to buy the car for her husband. And ironically enough, husband lived in Dallas. So we made the deal on eBay and, you know, he loved the car. Uh, we stayed in touch. And at this point, I started getting a little bit smarter with whenever I sell a car. I always usually ask for first right of refusal or the ability to stay in touch or whatever it might be because you don't know, right? And this isn't the only buyback that I've done. My white Dutch coupe up there on the four post it was, uh, was a buyback. My Lightning was a buyback. I've done a number of buybacks. So I'll touch on those you know, once we get through the story of the stalker here, because they all kind of signify and represent similar things. So sold the car, guy loved it, stayed in touch. And I think it was literally one, maybe it was two years later. It was either one year or two years later, pretty much to the day he reached out to me and said, Hey man, listen, I love the car, but I just don't drive it enough and don't enjoy it. Are you interested in buying it back for what you paid? And this is always probably one of the best ways if you want to set yourself up for a buyback is that usually, usually, you can end up in a position where I don't want to say you're stealing the car, but you're getting a good deal back when you do, in fact, follow through with a buyback. And that actually holds true in most of the cases um, with all the buybacks that I've done and one of the important parts that I want to touch on. So made the deal with him. Next trip from Dubai to the U.S., I flew right into Dallas. Uh, we took an airport limo from the airport to his house, picked up the car, drove it to my buddy's place in Austin, and the car's been with me ever since. And I didn't really need the car, but I wanted the car. And for the price, and, and Fox bodies were slightly, this is before like the exponential curve went up, you know, they were starting to rise. And, you know, sometimes you do the math and you're like, I couldn't build the car for that, right? We know how much paint costs this day and age. We know how much it costs to get the wheels and tires that we want and everything else. Um, so that is where the math comes in and where it's important that, you know, I know some people are like, don't buy back. It's like going back to an ex-girlfriend or whatever it might be. But think of it this way. You already know the car and you know the history of the car. So whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, at least you know. You know all the unknowns or what is unknown to anybody else who might potentially buy the car. So that's number one. Number two, there's probably some emotions and some sentiments and everything else that you wouldn't mind having back in your life possibly and especially if the price is right. And this is that important thing that I wanted to touch on because I couldn't rebuild the stalker for what I was gonna pay to get it back. The car was extremely well kept. In fact, he had done some pretty good maintenance items to it and upgraded a few things. Mind you, there was a few things I still needed to fix because it's Fox body, right? There's always something. And to me, 
it was the story behind it. Like at that point, after the buyback with Lewis, the journey across the country and everything else, it was like, man, this car represents or symbolizes some pretty serious milestones in my life, right? Like when you're out drinking with buddies and you're talking about the crazy shit that you did or where you went or whatever, so many stories surrounded this car. So it was just sort of natural to get back into it. Now, this car, right? Like I said, I, I got it back for what I sold it for. And even when me and Lewis bought it back off of uh, my other friend for the, the first buyback, uh, you know, the price was right considering that the paint needed some correction, the motor needed to be rebuilt and a few other things. So despite having to invest some money into it, it was money well spent. So there's that. Now let's look at something like my white Dutch coupe that's kind of lurking in the background there when I bought that car back. That car was probably better than when I had sold it, right? Um, when I sold it, I had taken, kept a bunch of, I kept the wheels and tires, I kept the stereo, uh, kept the Recaros, kept a lot of stuff. So the car was kind of stripped down and, you know, I made my money on it. And by the time I had the opportunity to buy it back, did I pay more than I sold it for? Absolutely, I did. And I explained that in that video as well. And the difference here is, is that, you know, the level of care that was given to the car and the upgrades and the maintenance and the, the storage keeping, because the car hardly saw any miles from when I had sold it. It was less than if I had a kept the car for all those years and paid to store it, even if I hadn't had driven it during that whole time that I didn't own the car. Because the reality is, if you own a car and you don't drive it, but you have it insured and you're making sure that the tires aren't going flat, the gas tank isn't going stale, the batteries aren't going dead, it costs you a thousand dollars a year to keep that car. So $10,000 dollars over 10 years, give or take, right? And so the way that I justified it in my head was I couldn't have kept the car all those years and had the same amount of money into it. So I bought it back. I'm happy that I did. My Lightning. My Lightning, I had sold and I capitalized off that deal. I sold it when I went to Dubai, right? Because Lightnings weren't sold over there. It was an import. It was an exotic to anyone that was over there. There's a good number of the trucks there, but you know, you don't see them on 23s and um, custom suspension and everything else. And I made my money on that truck. And when I ended up getting it back, the guy had done a whole bunch of work to it and maintenance and everything else. And I bought it back for less than I had sold it for, which was even a sweeter deal. So that worked out as well. The Sonic Blue Celine Clone Notch, another one probably a channel favorite. That car, right when I sold it to the gentleman that I went to high school with, and you know, he said, the, the same song and dance, guys, I'm never selling this car, this forever car. We always have, or generally have those intentions. And you know, five years goes by, he does a good number of mods and maintenance and, and everything else to the car. And I bought it back for exactly what I sold it to him. For, and that was pre-explosion of Fox body prices and versus post. So, you know, it was a great deal. So that's why I just kind of wanted to share some of these points with you guys, because you never know. Hey, you never know when you say something's forever. You don't know that it will be or that it won't be. You don't know that as soon as those taillights of your car go down the road that you might not want to have it back in your life and the future. So here's my recommendation. My recommendation is if you're giving up the documentation that goes with the car, which rightfully so it should. So if you have maintenance records and receipts and you know, the original purchase agreements, window stickers, all that stuff, it should go with the car, but there's nothing stopping you from keeping copies. So that way, you know what the VIN number is, you know, you know what the history, and it's all pretty easy to keep this stuff now versus I know some of the guys 20, 30 years ago trying to find that old insurance slip or, you know, registration card or whatever it might be. But always keep some documentation so that 
you have a trail or a record that you can reference in the future if you're trying to find the car. Number two, find the right buyer that's going to allow you to keep in touch with them once you sell that car and try and say, hey, listen, I want first right of refusal. You go to sell this car, you need to reach out to me. Some people take this shit seriously and you'll have a legal contract written up about it. For Fox Body, probably not so common, but you know, the good old handshake deal um, is, is usually sufficient. And now we have all these ways of keeping in touch, whether it's through Facebook or text message or WhatsApp or whatever it might be. It's pretty easy to keep in touch with people. And if you're selling to the right type of individual, they shouldn't have a problem with you keeping in touch with them either. So do those things and you might find yourself in a position to maybe get the one back that you lost or that you let go. And, you know, I get it. Sometimes we sell stuff, changes in life, economic, uh, maybe we're having kids or you're getting married or you're doing whatever. And, you know, you're trying to put money in different places or the right places. You're starting a business, doing all those things. So it happens. And sometimes we want to get them back. So hopefully this story is of a benefit to somebody out there or maybe just interests you guys that uh, the amount of buybacks that I've done in the past. In fact, it's a little surprising to myself, but fortunately, you know, I've been in a position to get the cars back. And I feel like to me, the memories are important, right? Um, all my friends are car guys or they're people that I've met through buying cars from or, you know, been at car shows and, and meets or growing up with about cars. And I think the stalker Bert here and the story of Lewis is just the absolute perfect example of, you know, when you always have that time when you're going out and you have that story that you're telling and it's always coming back to a common denominator like this, then that's a pretty important part of your life. So um, try not to let it go. If you got to let it go, do the right, follow the steps to make sure that maybe you can get it back one day. So there you have it, folks. Thanks for listening to my uh, story slash advice ramble. Not sure if you found it informative or not, but like I said, I watched that story on VinWiki the other week and I'm like, you know what? Not a bad thing. You know, it was actually about a bandit car of all things. It had nothing to do with a Fox body or a Mustang. It was about a damn bandit car and the story stuck. And I was like, I could empathize. I could relate. So hopefully it resonates with you guys as well. So thanks again. Till next time, we'll catch you back here on the Infamous Project.